After 14 years of international experience as an urban planner in government and consultant organizations, Michael joined the DPU in 1977 and gave 29 years to postgraduate teaching, consultancy and research. He was a senior lecturer in postgraduate courses on urban land management, urban management and land for housing. He was also the director of the MSc degree course in urban development planning. How did your interest in urban land planning come about? I think it's simply by default. I was interested in initially in the physical aspects of cities. As I say, I thought they were something that were designed like houses and you looked for uh, creating some sort of quality environment. It was basically defined in physical terms. Uh, land planning was somewhat suspect in my educational program master planning. I, my mentor was a man named Paul Davidoff who's very much into whose plan is it, planning theory. It was very nascent at that time and uh, he raised questions that I felt were very legitimate about the nature of urban planning well, that I have continued to find relevant the rest of my life. But nevertheless there I was trying to deal when I went out into practice with physical planning, planning land and, and the location of buildings and even some of the relationships of buildings going into what others might call urban design. That's what I was doing when I was practicing with a consultant in New York, a consultant in Washington DC and then later with two national physical planning departments in Uganda, Kenya and then also in in southwest of Britain. And even when I later was working three years in Lambeth Council. So did you come to look at urban land planning differently when you came to the DPU? When I began to teach? Yeah. No, though, but there was more opportunity to explore some of my questions about it. Consequently, I, I came to think that it really didn't amount to very much, if I was to make that pronouncement now, which I do do. I'm still teaching a bit in Germany. And I've reached the point now where I challenge the students when I'm teaching urban land management by saying I think that urban physical planning, master planning, land use planning doesn't amount to anything at all. Why does skepticism? My skepticism is based on the fact that it's, it's politically implemented. The nature of it is not rational as professionals would believe it. And the rationality that it's claimed is based on very little evidence and I'd rather people have a much more critical and analytical view of it and of the whole area of how you deal with land, land policy and the things that happened on, happen on land. Mm -hmm. Going back a bit, what would you say were the dominant discourses regarding urban land and development when you started practicing? Well, of course there was the concern about low-income settlements and at that time there was a lot of destruction of them simply because they were there and they were unattractive and they spoke of something that national governments didn't want to have to acknowledge. And at that time John Turner's influence and others, certainly I was aware of the idea that you could support low-income settlements better than you could get results that were wanted by many by destroying low-income settlements. Were there any discussions about land titles and tenancy? There wasn't so much talk about titles and tenancy then. The main concern was simply the living conditions. That came on much later and that, and, uh, that was something I took up much later. The discourse about urban planning, about urban land, was that urban planning, as I say, was something of great value and that you could do it and that's what I was doing. But I realized I was doing it in very special circumstances and even that made it very difficult to implement and was questionable because I was making decisions about how land was being used that I couldn't be content with because of the way it affected people's lives. I can think of how I planned some government land in Kisumu for low-income people when this plot was available in the middle of the city. I thought it would be convenient for them 
and they were the majority of the people in the area, and so I laid out small plots. Later on, before this was actually implemented, a uh, Kenyan came back from training in the United States who was from that area. He was appointed the local officer, and by his own choice or by pressure from the local people, the plan I had done was scrapped, and it was laid out instead for with large plots for high-income people who snapped them up because these were government plots that were then allocated at below market prices to people according to procedures that were never that controllable. But here I was making decisions like that. I could have been making decisions uh, that many people would have said were entirely for the wrong reason. But who decides what the reasons are? Mm. What are the good reasons? So what are the changes that occurred in urban land planning? Not long ago I was asked to talk to a group in Trinidad actually about what the DPU was doing that was different and it caused me to reflect upon changes in the profession as I could see them of urban land planning over the years. And they, basically they, they were very few, very few and unremarkable. There was perhaps a greater sensitivity to certain things. People would talk more about what was inequitable or unfair. But those concerns were around when I was being educated in planning. What I found lacking in all this eventually was a real acknowledgement of the role markets played in managing urban land. And that I, I took up at the end of the 90s. There is a belief, isn't there, that um, urban planning is a strong tool to enhance economic development. What are your thoughts on that? No, I think it's a very weak tool for promoting economic development. Yet, it, throughout my career, I think it must continue today. To think about laying out industrial states, industrial areas, in order to attract industry and think that that then produces economic development, I don't believe it at all. It just moves it around. I, I spent some time working with Nigel Harris on a course on economic development, local economic development and it gave me an opportunity to explore some of the suspicions that I'd always had and it was pretty clear that there was no basis for thinking that making land or even buildings available however you define that to entrepreneurs had a major effect on their ability to become established and be more productive whatever it was it's a factor, but it's a rather minor factor. The major problems I found were lack of management skills, ma lack of access to capital, basically, mm. and sometimes lack of access to skills and not land. You touched upon what you were teaching at the DPU. What were your main concerns at the time? The notion that I'm really concerned about, and, and that is to push people to improve their capacity to analyze, to critically analyze things, which I think is the most important thing that I've ever been able to support as, as an educator. An accompaniment to that is to, at the same time, know enough that you can be innovative. That is, that with this analytical, critical capacity to take things apart and to evaluate them, to assess them, then it's I think it's important to have the ability to think about new ways of putting things together or learning from the experiences, having evaluated them, to build upon them uh, in a way that's innovative. You remember that I came from about 12 or 13 years of practicing urban planning. and My interest in coming to the DPU wasn't just that it dealt with developing countries, but it was dealing with what was going on the nature of the problems that existed in the practice that was being performed <coughs> to try to deal with them. And it was that that interested me, but, at the, but coming up against people like Nigel Harris, I had to consider and, and say here, uh, what sort of ideas, what sort of theory, what sort of principles lay beneath uh, the practice, and it was this relationship between practice and theory, practice and ideology, 
whatever concepts that I found very interesting and which I wanted very much to maintain in in my teaching. It was so I did deal with technology or the techniques of planning when I was teaching. Students expected that, but my notion of how to deal with them was not to lay them out as this is what you do, but this is what people do. Let's look at it critically. Let's analyze it and see whether they can mm. accomplish what they can do. Here's a body of knowledge that contains ideas, concepts, theories, uh, ideology. What do they have to say about the practice? What does the practice have to say about them? And that was something that I tried consistently and continue to try to do. It's not good enough just for me to talk about theories and concepts. In this respect then, the consultancy you work, you did, gave you a strong footing in practice. I was part of that group, like Pat, like Barbara Mumtaz, uh, other people that don't come to mind immediately, that uh, Sheila Meikle, for example, we would, we were all interested in having that consultancy work, as we called it, in order that we could maintain some closer knowledge of what was actually going on in the way of how cities were developing, but also in what people were doing about it, or mm. in response to it, whether it was governments or the people themselves. So Michael, what would you say are the greatest challenges of urbanization we face? All my career, people have been saying, uh, talking about complex problems, complex solutions. Well, it is complex, but nobody seems to recognize what that means or, or really what the definition of complexity is. And then in the case of urban development, it really means something. Part of that is, to my mind, it means that you cannot really understand it. And therefore, sometimes in urban planning, maybe a lot of the time, maybe most of the time, we do things that we don't know what it will produce, what they will produce. And the other thing, perhaps it's related, because there's an aspect to it. We talk about development, urban development, the development planning unit. In my early days here, development, the nature of development was an important issue. I don't know that it's addressed so much anymore. Certainly there was a time when I found my colleagues that sort of stopped doing that. What is it? What do we mean? I've never been content with the notion that it was a matter of improving the gross national product or bringing social change or being more equitable. What do these things mean? What ultimately are we all about? I've been very interested to see how in economics there, there have, has been, during the last 10 years, perhaps around 2005 more than anything, there was a concern with happiness as something that economics could hope to hold up as a purpose for any action of or theory of economics. Uh, now we talk about well-being. I think it's sort of running away from it. If development is about bringing well-being rather than just improving quality of infrastructure provision or the standard of housing accommodation, then maybe we're getting somewhere, but we still have a long, long way to go because the issue is, to come back to it, very complex. What it constitutes, I don't know. Without that, what's the purpose of it all? And without that purpose, how can we discern what is important to be taking up in the knowledge aspect of what is being taught and what is important to be used as the criteria for assessing when you're doing critical analysis? You need to have an objective to have criteria. They provide the values there. And if it's just about providing more water to people, that's not good enough. Uh, people, I've, I've seen people in the field who have, by comparison to international standards, inadequate water. But they look like, in their lives, at, when I see them, 
that they are more content, or whatever it might be, happy with their lives than people who are f flushing down the toilet more water than they might enjoy in a day. And that means something to me. But until you can answer these questions, you can't really say what development is all about.